Okay, hello. Uh, delighted to welcome you all to Idea Space with the Urban Design Group, Urban Naus, and me, Christopher Martin. Um, I'm an urban designer and planner focusing on the design of, of public realm and streets. I'm on the executive committee of the Urban Design Group and co founder and director of Urban Strategy at Urban Movement. For this episode, we'll be focusing on art and culture, getting to the bottom of how and why this is so essential for us in cities in delivering better quality places and the effect and power of art on us as human beings. I'm joined from London by cultural strategist and producer and partner at Future City, Sherry Dobbin. Sherry, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Christopher. I'm excited. And it's, it's great always to talk about uh, culture and arts being at the, the center of what we do and as a part of the community as opposed to something um, separate. So uh, one thing that you had asked me is a little bit about, you know, what are what are some of the ideas when you know what's my connection and and how does this fit with with urban and um so i thought i'd, I'd share a couple of images yeah with, please that'd be great yeah with everybody and um just to say that um i started in the performing arts and um the performing arts um rely upon collaboration and one of the things in the in the actual practice is how you pull various people together and you get them to a central place of understanding. And from that, you create something together that you wouldn't have been able to do on your own. So from, from the beginning, I, I found as I started to transition out of strictly an arts form that all of these skills and this, this way of working translates very, very well um, to tackling problems to helping people overcome fears, to helping them be more ambitious, to take risks, and to understand how artists and the arts can help us push ourselves, not just in the area of, of showcasing or producing arts and culture, but really how it helps us to advance ourselves and be more ambitious and risky. Um, I uh, was really interested in this idea of how do we make room for the future? not just taking best practice and thinking that we just repeat it. How do we anticipate what is the aspiration of what arts and culture are doing and what the civic space wants? Um, I started uh, from a background, as I say, in performing arts. And, and for a while, I ran an insane um, art center. But the only way I can describe the Watermill Center is to say that we were the laboratory for developing the future of the avant-garde. And so I was able to work across a site that had all different types of indoor and outdoor spaces and work with artists from all over the world in different genres and different practices and help them to understand where their work might fit. And it helped to figure out where it fits within our, um, within our cities, our rural environments and our natural spaces and really taking arts outside of a closed box or a specific context. Um, and then, then I had this wonderful opportunity to actually develop and run a public art program in Times Square. And I sent off a proposal that was completely cold and I thought there was no way they would go for it. And I basically said, the premise is Times Square, everybody will always come. People are coming from all over the world. They're just excited to be there. They're willing and open to see everything. You have an obligation to make it a city center again. And what makes a city center for New York, you know, is the relationship to the arts. But not only that, you have an obligation because you're gonna have an audience no matter what, to be crazy experimental and push the boundaries. You know, so what gets me excited is our having, you know, collaborations with space that we wouldn't expect. You know, this was a play that took place over 12 hours or 24 hours for a sleeping audience where people would go down into this basement of a building in Times Square and lie down in cots and an entire performance would happen around them. We mounted you know, um, an opera that was actually um, conceived of and directed by a visual artist, but then done by professionals who um, were experts in German expressionistic opera. One of the most obscure forms, even opera people don't like it, and it was packed and people loved it because we understood how to use the city as the set and the scene. The thing about Times Square that, you know, from the outside people don't understand that actually New Yorkers love to hate it. And so one thing I love to do is to challenge the perceptions people have of space. And a lot of the ways that you can challenge people's perceptions very quickly is through programmatic work. 
So one of the first things we did on the day that the world was supposed to end was to have a, a, a huge gathering and have a happening. And Yoko Ono gave me permission to use John Lennon's um, Imagine. And we sang Imagine while her film of Imagine Peace ran up until midnight. And so I feel that we're responsible for the world not ending. Um, we did things like took over, I set up a program where I had to coordinate with 153 different people to get the electronic billboards in Times Square. And we set incredible visual works that still happen. It's been eight years running every single night. And then it wasn't enough to do that. We decided that we actually could incorporate sound so we could find a way that we started silent discos that were actually coordinated with the screens and it turned the whole environment into a, a performance place. Um, there was a point where there was a government shutdown. And so I had a piece that was called Capitalism Works For Me, True or False, where people actually got to discuss capitalism and surprise us with their vote about how it happened. Um, there was a point where it was really being questioned whether there was any authenticity left in New York anymore. And so we actually worked with an artist who set up this mock sort of newsstand, bringing back something that was nostalgic, but actually was filled with work from contemporary artists. We did the first project with the French artist, JR, where he actually worked with the government as opposed to against it or in guerrilla to create a piece that covered the ground in Times Square with people's faces. Um, and then, you know, one of the weirdest things I guess we ever did, you know, and when you get to take these, these odd things that make no sense is we held a concert for dogs performed by, you know, the underground artist, Lori Anderson, um, in January, you know, before midnight in collaboration with her piece that was on the screen. And she did this also so she could celebrate the first responders, the canine unit, first responders um, for 9-11. So late at night, we had an incredible foray of um, police officers all decked out, you know, with their canine unit and giving honor. We created seating then that was specifically designed to look up at the screens. And then that has turned into now a permanent emblem of place. And so I think the thing that excites me about the intersection between arts and culture and city space is that there's a nimbleness and a quickness that you can actually play with ideas and you can test them and people can surprise you by what they will do or they will take from their public place. And it really, really can inform, you know, the, the long-term design. And so, you know, one of the things that, um, that I talk about is, is this idea that I have up on the screen right now, which is that you know, cultural organizations and creative industries, they're a sustainable investment to keeping a place dynamic. As occupiers, they will always, always create, they will always be showing off what is of interest and in relationship to, you know, what are the contemporary themes of the day. And so for me, that's what really, that's what really drives me, how to bring those, those aspects together. Um, and ensure that we can always feel that we can redefine our space. That's brilliant. I love the idea that um, in cities we, we always have an audience no matter what. So so basically be bold, be bold. I think there's a clear message in there for, for urban designers and, 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 and cities as a whole. <laughs> I'd really like to sort of boil down into a lot of what you said and, and sort of look specifically at the challenges first. Um, the challenges we face um, as urban designers. I think numerous projects uh, we see in London, but also nationally and internationally, they start off with an enormous hoopla and, and great ambition when it comes to how they want to engage with art and, and indeed cultural strategy and what they want to deliver. And I thought all too often as projects progress, art and cultural strategy sometimes fall into the role of a nice to have, something less serious than buildings and roads and get diluted and put in a corner. Why do you think this happens? Um, what is it about our process or history that means we prioritize in the way we do? Um, well, I think a lot of this comes down to like what, what is statutory delivery and what is not. And, um, you know, I, again, I speak as an American um, also and an American living in London, um, but then we have work in different countries. But what, you know, one of the dangers is a, as soon as arts or culture aren't seen as a statutory delivery, which can be demonstrated through if it's taken out of education, for example, 
then people start to think of it as a nice to have. And that's just in our heads constantly in, in the periphery. So every single time you have to reintroduce the idea of what culture actually is and how it's really the glue or the adhesive that cuts across. And so I think you're exactly right. The problem is often in the process then and how it's easy to sort of, to write it out. Where we have an advantage right now is that the, what people, what planning has been using for the last sort of, and developers have been using for the last 20 years, it doesn't work anymore. And particularly accelerated by pandemic and then in the UK, you know, with, with Brexit, you can't just fill up your ground floor the same way anymore. Yeah. So now people want to know what else can you do? So now we're starting to find that more people are coming and saying, oh, well, maybe we should take a look at a culture and where that fits in. And um, I think what's important and, and also what's difficult is that culture very often is the element that joins together all of the other shared objectives. Culture is a, is a place in which the commercial interests, the civic interests, the community interests, and the consumer interests can all be spurred or elevated or excited through culture. And because it, it can be over, overlying or intersecting with other deliverables, it's why very often it's hard to place, you know, it or ring fence a budget, you know, yeah. for it specifically. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's the process. And one thing that we're doing with the Urban Art Forum as part of Urban Land Institute, we, we put out a publication called Including Culture and Development. And while it has case studies, what we actually did was, was work with individuals all across who are involved in, in creating our, our urban realm to create a methodology. There's basically a six step process and this can scale up or down. And it helps you with no matter where you are to go through a series of questions and to understand who you need to involve to get what it is that you think is right. And that is one of the key things. It's not just giving an answer and people replicating it. It's understanding why that case study was so successful and then giving them you know, the tools and the process to be able to find their own answer that's gonna give them their own USP. Yeah, absolutely. And how, how do you think we go about sort of hardwiring this into, in, into the places we shape, into developments? I mean, you've spoken about that. A sort of the Urban Land Institute work, which is which is really interesting. Um, but I suppose it, it, what what is it that we need to change at, at a sort of local, national, or at an individual de development basis to um, to make it not a choice, to make it something that actually is just is just nailed on? Um, well, I mean, it it could go into the planning process, and it could easily be you know a, a condition of being able to put forward your planning application. You know, there are ESGs now that are in different percentage that is, you know, the way that councils will rate to planning application. So it's very easy to say, well, we'd like you to have a cultural strategy for your place, you know. Something for and, the new design codes, maybe, of the white paper. Yeah, and, um, you know, there's the possibility also of having a simple toolkits. One thing we're talking about with Urban Art Forum is being able to put forward something to... Um, a suggestion of what would make uh, licensing and then also event licensing much easier. You know, here's what you could provide that would make it very, make it very easy for um, cultural institutions to be able to do things in your public space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a possibility for having guidance of here's the basic template or format that you would need to give to your developers to produce a cultural strategy so they can produce it for you. The way to think about it is that if you have a cultural strategy the vision and the principles that you put behind it, that is your identity. Your branding is the contemporary way in which you sell that identity. But you want to have an identity of place that you're gonna be able to use for the next 10 to 15 years of development that will be strong enough and robust enough to be able to adjust and, and flex. This can save you know, the planning, the design and the development process potentially a year, if you set that early on and you have that ingrained, it will actually help everything else. Yeah. And we're finding now that we're getting pushed to, to bring cultural anchors into development so they can actually uplift, you know, the profile of retail that they can attract and the f and that they can attract. So it's not to take away from, it is to contribute to. And it does have a value not only unto itself, but into what it is that you can put on the place and the other occupiers and tenants who might be present.
yeah, hugely. It's, it's, it entirely defines our perception of a place, doesn't it? So I think it's that value there is huge. And I think link, linked to that point is um is being able to demonstrate that the sort of tangible be- benefits of, of embedding art and this, this sort of cultural strategy in the place that we deliver. Um, I appreciate it. there's a huge array of benefits which aren't sort of tangible and, and, and we can't touch them, but what's your experience of demonstrating the benefits of art and, and cultural strategy to us and places? And, and can you share any of this work with us? Yeah, I mean, like I said right now, one thing that we're finding is that um, the presence of a cultural strategy is attracting better tenants for development and better tenants for the development also means, you know, a a better commercial rate. Um, You know, we've just done a a lot of research for one particular uh, client through Future City and we're finding that, you know, the creative industries that space can be sold, you know, very often at at the um, commercial market rate. Um, So what we're finding is that it helps, it helps to uplift everyone. And you can find those benchmarks of if you have something on site and if you don't. Another thing that we're working with, um, with Urban Art Forum and hopefully with Creative Land Trust is actually to come up with, um, to come up with some very basic measurements that help us not just to measure what happened, but what we're trying to do is find the measurements that helped us to predict and project for investors about how involvement in culture will actually provide for them a more stable or a more com- you know, commercially viable um, investment. So that's, that's the next trend. Forget about measuring what happened. How can we take the information that we have and start to demonstrate how it can actually um, show you a much, a much more profitable investment by going yeah. this route. Are there, are there a couple of examples you can draw on there just to, who, who's doing it well at the moment, I suppose, is, it would be a, a nice thing for people to go Who, who is out. demonstrating well? You mean the, the, the sort of evidence of it? Yeah, or, so which, which cities are doing well in, in embedding strategy or which developments are doing well in, in kind of, in, in that respect? Who, who would be your kind of the, the benchmark at the moment, you think? Well, I mean, you know, London has been really strong and, and this mayor in particular, you know, the investment that they put of their, their cultural team and how their cultural team works with, with planning has been incredibly beneficial. Not only that, and that they've done a, a lot of research and study that's pulled together a lot of numbers that you can find in their cultural infrastructure plan. Um, I, you know, personally, I love working with the city of Melbourne. I think the city and then the state of Victoria have been working quite progressively between their cultural sector and and also their developers and finding how they put it into their policy, but they also have incentives for it. So they find a way to incentivize, you know, the um, the cultural sector in being able to do it. And there we have a, a project where our cultural strategy as part of the planning permission actually fast tracked the largest development in, in Australia wow. through COVID because of the clarity of vision, the credibility and the feasibility about how it really tied into the area. And then also, I think, you know, working with the Heart of London um, Business Alliance, they just had Arab do a report to, to benchmark the impact of culture on the West End. And then also what's happening as a result of the restrictions, you know, due to COVID and what that's going to do to the cultural sector and then how that's going to have a knock-on effect, and already we can see it, has a knock-on effect for all of the other businesses in the area. So there, there are more and more. It's just there's so many statistics. There's so many ways in which people explain it and measure it. And what we're hoping is, you know, we might be able to find maybe five key factors that we use and we measure on a regular ballot, you know, basis. And then that can be put into um, an investor analysis as just a matter of routine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I always find myself smiling when I walk around Rotterdam as well, just because all the playfulness that comes out in the in the cityscape as a whole. I think it, that, that's what's really important. But I think just just onto that, I, mean, um, I think we can all sort of agree on the fact that we need a little pick me up uh, after this year. Um, yeah. uh, the world's changed, and, and I argue we could we could we could do with this cheering up. But I think, do you see artistic interventions as a way, if not the way, um, out of this for the human spirit and for urban places? And what's the first event or activity we should we should organize for cities around the world? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it, it's starting to happen. It's one of the only ways that we're going to be able to encourage people to, to come back into um, city centers. And, and it's part of what I was saying about, you know, if you invest in being able to have cultural institutions and, and creative businesses in the area, they will start to develop it anyway. And they mainly, you know, sort of they want permission. And, and 
you know, the, the creatives are the first ones who responded during the pandemic, you know? Yeah. It was major recording artists who within like 24 or 48 hours started giving concerts from their homes. The creative industries will just respond, you know, as quickly as possible. Um, and if I can, I'll just share a couple of, I'll, yeah, please, yeah. I'll flash through, you know, from, you know, different sort of uh, scale of idea. So you just have to pardon me for a moment. That's all good. Oh, oh technology. Yeah. Oh, technology. So, um, yeah, one of the things we've been talking about is that, you know, like pivot, adapt, scale, surprise, engage, invite, question, convert. This is all part of placemaking. This is all what creatives do anyway. Um, flash, flash, flash. I'll get to the point in a second. Um, but you know, some suggestions. Use your artists and your graphic designers to project onto large scale environments quickly. This was part of what we did with the Reveal Festival at the VNA and commissioned, you know, five great graphic artists and for a small amount of money to be able to, you don't have to do projection mapping. You can find a quicker and easier way to do it. You can use graphic designers to start creating these large scale environments that also make, um, help direct people or close off certain areas, but do it in a playful way that encourage them to almost be a participant in a huge board game. You can think about how all of your small venues actually are sort of sculptures when they're not being used. So that any of those wide open spaces when we can't, when we feel like we've got curfews or things like that, they don't feel empty. You know, you can think about how you bring things that were all in a shop and you might bring them out in front of it and have, you know, live broadcasts and activity that's an extension of it. You know, Paul Coxedge did this wonderful piece last year as part of London Design Festival. Think about seating that separates us, but in a really fun and desirable way. You know, Wembley immediately just took their busking and like put it on a platform. That's all you had to do to do the social distancing and still have the entertainment offer. Mark Titchener had this work um, of his that he redid and quickly revamped and then was just scattered across all of the outdoor advertising, you know, throughout the city. Um, you move cultural institutions in that are going to constantly collaborate. Fashion designers immediately started collaborating with Broadway and West End costume designers. Just keep your ambition high. You know, use your creative sector. People are coming up with these ideas for apps where you can visualize the distance that you need to have. Victor and Rolf just started designing, you know, wear that you want to have that keeps people at a distance. Um, you know, entire cities are saying, well, this is your great opportunity, you know, to extend your piazza, turn your street into a plaza, turn it into a playground. Think about how your theater spaces, even if you can't go in with the traditional way, you know, how you might reuse it. Use it as an opportunity to be playful, you know, with your parks or think about, you know, like Leo Villarreal has done with Illuminated River. Use huge scale and treat the entire, you know, city as as an artwork. There, there are many, many ways that you can do things now. There are many ways we could refocus some of the work that have been happening inside. And basically, what we should be thinking about is how our city is the cultural institution. It is our exhibition space. Or like you say, Christopher, we are in a performance all the time. Right, and people are photographing all the time. We're constantly in a photo shoot. So let's do things that make people feel excited to be part of it. And if vanity is one way to lead people out because they want to take a photo of themselves within it, well then, great. But use your designers to help you create a space that, that makes it fun to investigate keeping space between or dividing up or being in sections or feeling like now you have a little box, you know, when you're sitting in the park and it's a private place. Turn the perspective into an opportunity to play with scale that you haven't been able to, um, you know, in the last sort of five to 10 years where we've been pushed to think that only huge numbers, you know, were the measure of success. It's a really important takeaway, I think. Um, um, be bold, keep your ambitions high and be playful, I think that's, that's that's all we need. And, and, I, and we, could, we could talk about this all day, I know, um, but I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Um, yeah. <laughs> so thank, thank you, Sherry. Thanks for sharing those ideas. There's, there's, loads, there's loads to inspire um, and loads for, um, to, for the urban designers watching to apply um, in their work. So really valuable um, to everyone involved in shaping cities. Um, yeah, thank you so much for an opportunity to share some of the, the thoughts and the work that great artists and creatives are doing. 
Yeah, thank you. And, and that just leads me to say thank you to, um, to everyone who's listening to this. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Ideas Based by the Urban Design Group, Urban Naus and me, Christopher Martin. Uh, more episodes coming your way, so please do get in touch if you have any questions and check out the event page of the Urban Design Group to see more around urban specials. Thanks very much. <laughs>